uh, the projector. All right, you'll stand here. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Dominic. Uh, I work as a developer evangelist for a company called Twilio out of Berlin. Uh, first of all, uh, green screen. Um, first of all, thanks for everyone letting me be the last thing that spread, uh, separates you from beer. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, quick introduction of what Twilio is. Twilio is a cloud communications platform that allows you as developers to easily send, uh, build different means of communication such as sending SMS, receiving SMS, voice, video, or any kind of communication into your apps using REST APIs and client-side SDKs. Uh, so definitely something you should check out. Um, but today I'm not there, uh, not here to talk about Twilio, but instead I'm going to talk to you about uh, how I hacked my coffee machine. Or rather, uh, how I took this coffee machine that actually belongs to my flatmate uh, <laughs> and uh, slightly tuned it into this uh, thing uh, with cables coming out of it. Um, and it's actually standing here. I'm going to show it later and you can also come by later if you want to take a closer look at it. Um, also, spoiler alert, does anyone really want coffee right now? Nobody? Uh, there's one person. You, you're the lucky person who's going to get coffee later. Uh, <laughs> all right, but let's first talk about why I would actually do this. Why would, you, why would anyone hack their coffee machine? Um, there were actually a couple of reasons. The first one was it's interesting because um, when I was a kid, I used to like take my computer apart every once in a while and kind of like peek into what's actually under the hood. Uh, and I have the feeling like nowadays we just don't do this anymore. Uh, I think most of us didn't really take anything apart that is in their household for a while. Uh, because in fact, companies make it really hard for you to take things apart. Things have to get smaller, uh, but it's also kind of like people just, uh, companies just don't like when you tamper with their stuff. Um, so if you, if you think about it, like my phone, you can't even replace the battery. With, the laptop, with my laptop, I have a MacBook. It, got harder and harder to even put like new memory into it or something. Um, so companies really make it hard to kind of peek under the hood and understand what is actually happening in the devices. Uh, and I think it's kind of unfortunate because we sort of lose touch with the actual technology that is making possible what we work, uh, what we daily use and partially work on. Um, the other thing is I have an Alexa at home. And uh, I have a couple of IoT devices at home that allow me to do things like Alexa, turn on the living room and it turns on the lights. Or Alexa, t turn on movie time and it like dims the lights to 20% and turns on the TV. And these kind of things are really cool, but whenever you want to do something with IoT uh, and you don't build it yourself, you have to buy something really expensive and you just like build trust whatever they do. Um, so I wanted to kind of think, uh, I wanted to take a project where I would build one of these things myself to understand what is actually happening under the hood and how I could build these things myself. Plus I work on a daily basis with a lot of APIs. So I, the idea of like something on, in my household having an API that I can build stuff with um, was very interesting because then you can do things like this. If you grab your phones, if you go to bit.ly slash vote minus coffee, uh, during the whole talk, there's like just two buttons. You can vote on which coffee should be made later. And we're going to use this to kind of generate the coffee later. Or in other words, what should he drink? A whole coffee or an espresso? Um, all right, so now that we have like talked about the motivation that I had to do this, uh, let's talk about why the hell I would use JavaScript. Um, the typical thing when you think about hardware hacking is this like really low level uh, C++, maybe even just some like modified version of C, um, but it's certainly not something that was meant to run in the browser. Um, and there were multiple reasons for this. First of all, the last time I wrote C++ was in university and I don't really remember most of it. Um, the other thing was the whole project was a, uh, was a thing that was planned to be done during one night on a Friday night with a couple of beers. Um, so I thought JavaScript is certainly something that I can code faster because I code this on a regular basis. Um, and therefore, kind of like debugging this and figuring out different tricks would certainly be easier and faster. Uh, the other thing is, since I wanted an API, it obviously needs to be able to uh, spin up a web server or something to talk to the internet. And JavaScript was always designed for the internet. So kind of like networking things are just way more common there. Um, 
The other thing is it's more challenging because there's just not much documentation around hey, uh, how do I like control my coffee machine using JavaScript, you know? Like I can search for like coffee machine in Arduino and I'll get a bunch of pages on different hacker websites that tell me how to do it. Uh, but with this, like we kind of start with a blank page. I also see some people giggling there, happily voting, I think. Um, um, anyways, um, so uh, the other thing was uh, hardware and JavaScript are actually a really nice matchup if you consider that both of them have this event-driven nature. Uh, hardware, you want to do something when something else happens. Like you want to do something when a button is pressed or you want to do something if, if a certain value exceeds, uh, exceeds a limit. And with JavaScript, it was designed for us to react on different things. It's, meant to, you know, like we want to trigger something when a button is pressed. Sounds familiar? Exactly, that's why like it's a really nice matchup. Um, so we knew we wanted to hack this whole thing with JavaScript, but there were a couple of options that we could actually pick from because uh, even though I haven't had the chance to kind of hack something with JavaScript and hardware before, I had a bunch of hardware lying at home that I actually bought for that purpose. Uh, so we had a range of like different options and I, because I always wanted to play around with it but I just wasn't sure what I'm going to build with it and when I'm going to have the time and I, I bet everyone has like things like Raspberry Pis lying around that they're going to use someday and uh, they're probably still packaged. Uh, <laughs> so we had a couple of options at home. Uh, I'm going to kind of talk a bit through what we, what, what we were thinking about them and why we chose what we chose. Uh, so the first one is Esprino. So Esprino is a project that uh, was designed to run JavaScript on an ESPA266. Uh, I know that's a very common thing that everyone knows. Uh, for the people who don't know what that is, that's a super tiny microcontroller um, that actually costs, I think, $2 on Alibaba and you can literally order them in bags. Um, and they're like as tiny as coins. Uh, so they're really nice for kind of hardware uh, projects because they're super cheap. And Esprino is this way to, for you to not only run this on, uh, on, like run JavaScript on it, they actually come with a web IDE which makes it really nice to deploy this thing. And if you don't want to flash an Espr uh, ESPA266 yourself um, and kind of figure out how to transmit the data on it because it doesn't come with a USB port, um, you can get things like this uh, Esprino Pico, which is actually done by the person that uh, builds uh, Esprino. And this one is also pretty cheap, I forgot how much it is. But it has the flaw that it actually doesn't support um, Wi-Fi by default. So I, w I could hack this by either flashing an ESPA266 myself or soldering one on it. Um, and then that works as well. Um, but uh, I didn't really feel like soldering on a Friday evening uh, for the first time in years, um, which probably would have ended up with like the whole time just me trying to solder stuff and looking up on the internet how to solder properly. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there were a couple of other options. Uh, the next one is Tesla. So Tesla is actually an open source hardware project. Um, uh, this is the current Tesla 2. Um, it's a device that um, it's completely open sourcely developed. It's not a company behind it anymore. It's actually fully, every, the whole specs, everything is on GitHub. Um, uh, it's a real open source project. Uh, and I actually have one of these at home as well. And it's nice because the Tesla comes with Wi-Fi, it comes with Ethernet, it comes with two extra USB ports. So if you want to plug in a webcam, for example, you can do these sort of things. Uh, and it has analog and digital pins. Um, so it has, it has five volts and three volts. Uh, so it has a bunch of different things that we can play around with which are super useful for us. And the coolest thing by far is that it can run actual Node.js. So Esprino kind of comes with this uh, JavaScript engine that uh, can run uh, JavaScript and support some, uh, some modules that it comes with, but it's not full Node.js. Uh, the Tesla actually allows you to run full Node.js and actually use the whole NPM ecosystem up to a certain level because some packages are just so massive that they don't fit on and on the microcontroller. But in theory, you can leverage the whole NPM kind of ecosystem. Uh, and then there was a third option, and the third option is Johnny5. And Johnny5 is different, not because it's not open source, but it's, it's open source, but it's an NPM module. 
Um, and it's an NPM module that aims for you writing code that interacts with hardware, uh, but it, it's not limited to the Tesla or something. In fact, there are a bunch of I.O. plugins for all sorts of hardware. Uh, the difference, though, is that Johnny5 um, doesn't, for example, on an Arduino, you can't run the node code because the Arduino isn't able to actually run Node.js. Uh, but it uses uh, different I.O. plugins like the Fermat, uh, to talk over protocols like the Fermata protocol uh, to the different uh, hardware. So you can have this tethered to a smaller computer or something. Um, or you could even use the Raspberry Pi and then you can run it again on the same thing. Uh, but you could even tether like an Arduino to, an, uh, uh, to a Raspberry Pi and then you could run that. Uh, and that means again you can kind of like leverage the whole Node.js ecosystem uh, just that with a difference that you can't run the code and store the code directly on the device. Uh, on the microcontroller you will need some hosting uh, system uh, typically. But the great thing is that um, you can kind of code the whole thing very modular because at that point you, you use the same module and just when you initialize it you pass in what's the I.O. plugin that should be used to talk to my device. Uh, but you can still have a very very modular code. Um, but the greatest thing is that these two work together very well, uh, Johnny5 and the Tesla, because there's a Tesla I.O. plugin. And that means that we can write the code in a very uh, like portable fashion. So if we later need the Tesla for a different project, we can just swap this out to some other setup. And we, can, we basically barely have to change any code. It's like a one-liner. Um, and this is ultimately what we decided to go for, because we can store the program on the device, but we can also um, leverage the kind of Johnny5 library. All right, so the obvious question, how the hell did we hack this? Um, spoiler or disclaimer, um, I'm not an electrical engineer. I had two courses in school and I forgot about them, uh, as you will see in a couple of minutes. And my flatmate is neither an electrical engineer. Um, so we were kind of just interested in how this works. So we took the most scientific approach that it, there is for hardware hacking. We took a screwdriver and opened that thing. Um, and then we kind of peeked a look into it after we kind of removed every wall but the front wall. Um, and we found a couple of interesting pieces, namely in that corner. Um, and those were three things. Um, this was on the one hand the buttons uh, control plate that had all the buttons that of functionality that we wanted to interact with. Uh, then an interesting cable, uh, and I'll explain in a second why it's interesting, uh, and that led to a microcontroller. And this microcontroller is really the brain of the coffee machine. It's what controls everything. It uh, figures out how much water it needs to put in. It controls the, like this is like, it uses capsules. So it controls like pressing the content out and stuff like that. Uh, so that's really the brain. And then uh, the reason why this cable was interesting is that it was a pluggable cable, which meant that we could actually take the control plate out uh, and take a closer look at the control plate. And the idea here, uh, so this is how the control plate looks like. I have it with me if you want to take a look at it later. It's actually just like this big. Um, and the cool thing was we, we see this is where the cable was plugged in. And we could use this because we had the idea that uh, we can get rid of the control plate and we can just kind of fake the protocol that is being sent between the microcontroller and the control plate. And instead we put in, in uh, as a replacement for this, we put in our microcontroller and they, it just tells the coffee machine what, what it wants to hear. Uh, so we started by taking the one end of the cable and uh, jamming a bunch of jumper wires into it. Um, putting some tape around it so it doesn't fall off. Um, and then we connected the other side to the pins on the, uh, on the tassel so that we could uh, play around with this and see what actually happens when we do sp uh, different things. Um, before we started that, we kind of thought about what we actually know, uh, which is basically just what we see because we neither had a manual nor does like DeLonghi, which is the manufacturer of this, uh, provide me with an internal spec uh, for this coffee machine. Um, so it was pretty much what we what we saw and that was we had had eight pins so there were eight cables going going between the microcontroller and the control plate. 
Uh, we had six switches, uh, one for on, one for wa hot water, and then four for different types of coffee. Um, and then we had seven LEDs. So uh, one was for power, one was for, oh, uh, something didn't go as planned. Uh, and then the others kind of show different status on like the different types of coffee. Uh, based on that, we did some assumptions. Uh, obviously, one thing has to be power. We need power, else we can't measure stuff. Uh, so the whole thing wouldn't work if we don't have power on it. Um, we said at least three pins plus the power part uh, had to be pins that control the buttons so that if we have like some sort of binary flag system, this is how it would, would work. Um, and then similarly, we needed at least three pins that plus power that would control the seven LEDs, similar kind of like the binary flag approach, uh, which if you're still up with your math right now at this time, uh, equals to seven cables. So what the hell does the eighth one do? Um, but We'll worry about that later. Um, so we wrote some JavaScript. Um, this is the initial JavaScript that we wrote. I cut out a couple of points because I think you get the gist that like every initialization of a pin works the same way. Um, but basically what we do is we create a board instance. We tell it what's the IO plugin that we talk to, which is the Tesla one. Uh, and then once the board is ready, we initialize a bunch of pin instances where we say this is the pin, this is the reading mode, which was the analog mode. And then uh, we kind of put them in an array and just inject the whole array into the REPL that comes with Johnny5 so that we could, we wouldn't have to run a, a script the whole time, but we could actually kick it off once and then do whatever we wanted because we had access to the pins. Um, and then obviously we needed to connect this whole board to power. Uh, we had two different voltages that we could uh, use on the board. One was 3.3 volts, which is what we plugged in, and we saw that the LEDs uh, didn't really light up as much as we expected because there's still a casing kind of on top of it, so they had to be really bright to be seen. Uh, so we did the most scientific thing here as well. Uh, if 3.3 is not enough, it's, let's use 5 and see what happens. Um, <laughs> and uh, hey, they were brighter. I'm not sure if that was the brightness that was initially intended, but they were brighter and they didn't burn through, so that was fine. Um, but the problem was that the uh, analog readings that we tried to read on these pins were very fluctuating. Uh, because that's something that you have to deal with a lot when you when you do analog um, analog measurements. So we couldn't really figure out if something actually changed because of this fluctuation or because we pressed a button or something. Um, so we decided to switch to digital mode. Um, if my slide switches, there we go. Um, so the changes for digital mode were kind of minimal. We just set it to the default mode, which is digital. And the difference for, for kind of the measurements meant that instead of voltages that we were measuring, we were measuring highs or lows. That's the only thing that we had. Either it's on or it's off. It's binary. Um, and based on that, we were able to kind of start reading stuff because every time that we pressed a button, uh, the pins that were changing were pins 2, 3, 7, and 8. None of the others, but these four were changing. So we were like, all right, that seems all right, because we thought it would be three. Now we have four, so we should be on a good way, right? Uh, uh, but uh, so, so we were like, hey, there are buttons. They might be buttons because they react on buttons. And Johnny5 actually has a button class. So we were like, hey, these four pins, they are buttons. Do something. And this is where we see the power of JavaScript already with hardware because everyone can read what's happening here, right? We create some button instances and then we say on press and on release, just like we're used to from, uh, from JavaScript. Uh, we don't need a loop to see if the value changed or something. We just say like, all right, notify me when it happened and I'll do something. Um, so that's what we, what we kind of wrote uh, and we kind of ran the, ran the script and it sort of worked. Um, but it, it didn't fully give us the full knowledge that we wanted. So we also started using the other pins as like flags that we would turn on and off and see like what would happen if we uh, tried different combinations. So we started writing scripts that would just randomly turn on the different flags and stuff like that. We started taking notes and more notes. 
and more notes, and they're not really, like you can try to read them and I could explain you what we thought was going on there. Like you can see in the middle there, there we kind of like started writing binary things that we, we thought were uh, useful. Um, but ultimately we were onto something. Uh, because there were a few things that proved to be right. Uh, first of all, we knew pin one was power. Uh, so that was a proven assumption. Because four, uh, three of the seven LEDs lit up so clearly that must be power. Um, and then setting the pins four to six kind of turned on and off these different three LEDs. So they were clearly controlled the uh, LEDs. And that was exactly what we had as an assumption as well, right? We said that there got to be three pins that control all seven LEDs. And that worked. Um, seven and eight would always react on button presses. Uh, no matter which of the six you pressed, uh, under the condition that two and three were able to control each two of the buttons and enable or disable the, regis uh, the uh, registering of the click events. So if you set two to a high value, then suddenly the top two buttons would, would, uh, wouldn't work anymore. And then if you set the, um, if you would set the pin three, then you could turn that one off. And like, it was a really weird behavior. And by that time, I think it was like 4 a.m. or something. Um, we were like, eh, we will never figure this out. Um, but should we go to sleep or try it one more time? So we're like, all right, let's try it one more time back to the, back to the drawing board, quite literally. Uh, because we took the board and we drew it. Uh, <laughs> and for that we used uh, an open source software that's called Fritzing, which is made for designing uh, diag uh, diagrams of circuits, or like schemas of circuits. Uh, and we took that and the picture, so this was the first time we actually took that picture, this precise picture. Previously we looked at the small kind of control plate, and we're kind of like, eh, I think that's what it does. Um, and we, we walked the path, so we started with one of the pins and then we walked these these paths that you see on the thing, and we walked them with a multimeter and we measured, that was kind of like one of the few things I remembered from electrical engineering. Uh, if two pin, uh, uh, points are connected, there's zero resistance between them, so we walked the whole thing. Uh, I, I, my flatmate was kind of like measuring, and I was like, all right, what's between these two? And he's like, zero. I was like connecting them on the, on the diagram. And we ended up with this super useful diagram. <laughs> super proud of it. Uh, but it shows that we cared more about connecting the things than we cared about like lining it up nicely. But this gave us a lot of value because, um, so there are a few things here. The first one is the LEDs. Um, if you know a bit about LEDs, LEDs have this property that they only let you uh, glow up if current goes into one direction. The current can't flow into the other direction. Um, so since we knew how, they, uh, how like three of them lit up, we assumed nobody went like full nuts on this and like put the other ones like mirrored on it. Um, so we kind of like were able to arrange them all in the same direction because we knew how the current would flow from pin one. Um, so based on that, we saw one thing already. Um, and that was that not only pin one was power, pin two and three were actually power as well. And that was why we never actually lit up these LEDs, uh, the other LEDs, because we never put enough power on them. Um, so when, once we kind of put five volts on all of them, they all lit up, except of one which we burned in the process uh, previously. But that was because we literally put like five volts on that thing. Uh, <laughs> don't do that. Um, and then, so four to six, we're able to kind of control turning them on and off like we had before. Uh, about seven and eight were the only two that were reacting on buttons. They were the only two that, based on like, since one, two, three were power, all the buttons were ultimately wired back to seven and eight, which meant that it kind of doesn't make sense because cool, like I can measure that one of like, three buttons has been pressed because eight told me that a button has been pressed. But that's not, we can't turn that the other way around and say like, hey, eight has been pressed and the coffee says, oh yeah, I know, I know, I need to do that now. Uh, that's not how it works. So we took one more peek at like 6 a.m. Uh, onto the board and took a closer peek. And there were three things that we ignored. Uh, because when we drew this diagram, one thing you don't see there is all the black boxes because those were resistors and since we were measuring with the resistance anyways, we're like, eh, let's drop those. Um, 
uh, because they didn't really help us with, with the actual protocol. Uh, but three of those things that we thought were resistors were actually diodes, which we could have guessed based on the naming that they're D3, D4, and D6. Um, but at 6 a.m., those seem like details. Um, <laughs> So diodes and LEDs are very similar. Uh, diodes just, like LEDs are light emitting diodes. So therefore diodes just don't light up but have the same property of letting current only flow into one direction. Which meant that we could clean up our diagram. We dropped the LEDs since we fully understood how those work. Um, and we put in the diodes and had this cleaned up diagram. And suddenly we understood how the current flows and that uh, really these switches were just mappings between the different uh, pins and kind of like, so S1, uh, so the switch one would be the connection between P3 and P7, so whatever powers uh, flows between them, uh, and so on and so forth. And then the LEDs, we understood that anyways, but we had this mapping suddenly. Um, but since they were dependent on the power, this wasn't something that we could easily fake. Like we couldn't just say, high on this pin, which we were hoping would be the kind of thing that we could do. Um, so luckily, in kind of like a smart move, my flatmate thought before we started this, we should stop by a hardware shop and just in case buy some relays. Uh, so relays are basically switches, just that you don't need to click them, but you can digitally like trigger them. Uh, so our approach was, let's just wire up, now that we understand the wiring, let's uh, wire up the things with relays instead of switches. So we put the cables that we had um, onto a breadboard. We connected the three LEDs that were of interest for us and these three switches, which were power espresso and a large coffee. And we wired the whole thing up and then connected it to the board so that if we would turn on the pins that were green, red or purple on this diagram, if we would turn them on, uh, that would trigger the relay to open and then uh, if we turn them off, like we close it again. And this way we were able to um, basically fake a button press. Uh, this was our initial wire up. You can see the side is still open, the wire comes out there. Um, and then we just plug it in. We didn't have uh, enough female to male jumper wires. So we just took the relay board and flipped it upside down, which was the case until yesterday, until a, a friendly a uh, friend of mine gave, uh, was like, oh, you need some female to male jumper wires. I have some in my backpack and gave me some. So uh, it's a bit more cleaned up now. Um, <laughs> but basically uh, this way we were able, uh, we were ready for our first test. Uh, what we did was we wrote a small script. Uh, this is most of it, except of the board ready part. Uh, so we create a relay instance, which is another thing uh, that Johnny Five already comes with out of the box and this is why it's great. Uh, and we just told it, like, these are the pins that we plugged it in, put it into normally open and then close it immediately so we had like a click kind of sound to, to know that we're, the script was ready. And then we just injected them into the REPL again. And then we were able to test it the first time. So um, on there you see Grande open, we trigger that and there's water running out. We didn't test it with coffee immediately because we weren't sure if it's actually gonna work and we didn't wanna waste coffee. Like at 7 a.m. you really just wanna sleep and not like get a coffee. Um, so, but it, it, it ultimately worked. Like we had to, we were able to run Grande open, started brewing, Grande closed, it closed. So it worked. Um, the last thing we did is we kind of closed the sides, put a sticker, uh, like put the wire through where the buttons used to be, put a sticker on top of it and called it a night. Um, and that was kind of it. We were able to control it with JavaScript, but it wasn't an IoT device. Uh, because, I mean, the only way I could control this is through my REPL, uh, which isn't really an IoT device unless you sent me a message over the internet and I'm the IoT device. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and this is where kind of one initial inspiration that I left out came into place. Because the reason why we ran this project on that particular day was it was the last day before, the last weekend before a certain date. And I don't know if you know this thing, uh, that's an HTTP status code that is actually not an official status code. Uh, it's a proposed one. It was proposed in the IETF RFC 2324, uh, which proposes the HTCPCP. Does anyone know what that is? 
No, it's the Hypertext Coffee Pot Control Protocol. <laughs> and that was suggested by the IETF as an April Fool's joke in 1998. Um, and therefore, this was actually the last weekend before April Fool's this year, um, so 19 years later. And I was like, if we hack something, I want to write a blog post about it. I want to publish it on April 1st. Um, so we had, the, like, that was kind of like one of our deadlines. Um, so what is the Hypertext Coffee Pot Control Protocol? Uh, first of all, it's based on HTTP, so it gets kind of like a lot of the things from there. It adds a brew method, so <laughs> it's similar to post, is actually the same as post, uh, it's just brew. Um, they specifically mention, and I like to mention this, uh, especially in countries like Belgium, this is not limited to coffee brewing. Um, it may as well be used later in a, in a beer brewing uh, protocol. So if you're planning to write a beer brewing protocol, um, feel free to use a brew method. I think the IETF is fine with that. Um, it also modifies the definition of the safe header uh, and typically so safe is the header that you admit to tell if it's safe to do, uh, do a request again. Um, you can, aside of yes and no, you can also use now if user awake um, to kind of like make sure that um, you don't over caffeinate someone. Um, oh, sorry. And it uh, adds the accept additions header because that's how you tell it what you want in your coffee, right? Like um, it adds a bunch of different things. We're gonna look at it in a second. But this is basically where you specify what you want in your coffee. Um, it suggests the HTTP status code 418 that we looked at earlier for which scenario you're trying to talk to a, a teapot with a coffee pot control protocol. Obviously a teapot should reply with 418, I'm a teapot. Because it shouldn't understand that protocol. Uh, since it's a new protocol, we need a new URI scheme. Um, this is the English URI scheme. Uh, I'm going to explain in a second why I'm highlighting that. And it adds a bunch of other stuff. Uh, this is the accept additions. Uh, as you can see, it suggests everything from milk types, syrup types, sweeteners, spice, alcohol. I'm not sure if that was written by someone from Starbucks. Um, but it is very future-proof because the spice type, for example, actually doesn't specify what sort of spices. So if you're a fan of pumpkin spice lattes, uh, that's great. It's supported by the protocol already in 1998. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone knew what a pumpkin spice latte was in 1998, but it works. Um, this is why I said this is the English protocol. Um, the coffee pot control protocol is truly internationalized. Um, you see here the languages that are supported. Um, the thing why this is great is uh, from this point onwards, um, you will see a bunch of escape characters, uh, for example. It's actually specifically highlighted in one sentence uh, in this bank that uh, for German, the Kaffee, the K needs to be escaped as percent for B, which is a capital K, because in Germany you spell Kaffee with a capital K and that needs to be respected. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then like the other ones you can guess the idea with like Greek, uh, Hindi, Japanese, but that kind of like stood out for a second where I was like, wait, like that's a normal alphabet, like we should be able to use it, but it's like, it has to be capital. They, they mentioned that multiple times. Um, so the cool thing is um, obviously we had to implement this. Like there was no way going around it. If we need an API for a coffee machine, that's the protocol it should speak. And it, like we implemented a subset of it, not all of it, but it actually works. Uh, so I'm going to jump into a demo. Um, if my, my machine was super slow earlier, let's see. All right. Um, oh my God, it's so slow. Where's my cursor there? Um, uh, oh my God, this is super useless there. Um, yeah. My Visual Studio Code crash, that's also great. All right, um, so I'm gonna show you in the meantime, while this is booting up, um, I'm gonna show you quickly how this looks like. So if that thing starts, you should see the camera. Um, so we have, here are the relays, those are the switches that kind of control the whole thing. Uh, we have the three LEDs here that show the status. So the red one means that it's currently 
um, in standby, which isn't great. So I'm just going to turn this off and on here quickly. Um, once this turns off, uh, because the yellow now it's blinking, which means that it's heating up. But because it was already hot, it should be ready in a second. And then this is the Tesla. So this is where the wires go into. Uh, right now, the Tesla isn't running anything. The reason is that um, it, the internet connection here was sort of flaky. So I had to um, tether the thing with my phone. Um, and therefore, I'm actually going to restart this. So I'm going to deploy now the script uh, that I wrote, which is the web server. Uh, the way it looks like is, obviously, close that one as well. No. My cursor just doesn't move. I don't know what's up here. Uh, ha, 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 ha. All right. So this is like a s server that we have. Um, it's basically, you can see here, we're using the normal HTTP server module, no magic. We have a Latissima class, which I'm going to look at in a second. But this is basically all the thing that controls the actual coffee machine. Um, so that I had to write this code module, obviously. This is like not a fun project, right? This is like for production. Um, so I'm creating a web server uh, and then uh, I start listening and in here, I should stop, just stop moving the cursor. Um, in there, there we go. Uh, <laughs> So in here, we basically use a thing called local tunnel because I needed an externally addressable uh, URL. So local tunnel was the kind of thing that gave me that. Uh, and then once that is boot up, we create the instance of the coffee machine and we listen on an on ready event so that we could do what we wanted to do. Uh, if we scroll down, if it lets me scroll down, I think I'm just not going to use the cursor today anymore. Um, so. On the handle request thing, um, I didn't use something like Express because Express would have kind of like bloated up the whole program. So I did old school kind of like if statements and substring matching and regular expressions and things like that. But obviously the first thing we need to check is, is if my coffee machine is a teapot uh, because that would just be um, outrageous. So we have to reply with the right status code. <laughs> Um, and then we have get, which basically just checks if, um, like currently we can only get the set if it's on or off, which is sort of hacked. Uh, I'm going to get into that in a sec uh, later. Uh, but it's sort of hacked, which is basically we just keep an internal Boolean, which is on or off. Uh, but it, tell, it could tell me the information about that. Uh, further down, we have then the mandatory uh, check that it supports post and brew. Um, and sets currently the safe header to no because again, like we, the state thing is a complicated thing right now. Uh, we check for the correct content type, which can be in our case right now text plain or the actual suggested one in the protocol, which is application coffee pot control pro, uh, application coffee pot command. Um, it replies with message coffee pot. Um, it checks if it's authenticated. That one was sort of flaky in the spec, so I kind of implemented my own thing. Um, and then we check if the, uh, what the requested additions are, check if they're valid. If they're not valid, uh, the spec says we should reply with uh, 406, not acceptable, and reply with a list of valid ones. Um, and then we get the actual message body. We check if the URL is either, and this is again where I kind of had to improvise traditional coffee pots in 1998 just knew one type of coffee, which is coffee. Um, these kind of machines understand way more. Um, so I had to therefore kind of improvise a bit um, and kind of change the protocol. I didn't hear a click here, so let me just, oh yeah. Um, this happens when you're trying to hotspot and the hotspot turns itself off. Um, so let's turn this on again, start this, and go back into the code. Da, 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 da. Um, yeah, and then we basically, so we can either, if we click send start or stop to the actual pot indicator, then we will turn the machine on and off, and if it's to slash espresso or slash grounded, it will start and stop that protocol process. Uh, those are the functions that just parse it, so 
it's all open source. You can actually read this. Um, and then we have the Latissima class, and this one has all the other logic. Um, so the it's going to disappear in a second. The press button thing, for example, it just gets a relay and then it opens it and waits for a couple of milliseconds and then closes it. The reason why we do this is uh, when the on the coffee machine when you press a button quickly and then release it, it will just start. Uh, it will put uh, brew the coffee as long as necessary. If you keep it pressed, it will press until you release it. Uh, so we kind of like had to fake a human uh, human uh, pressing to. Uh, trigger this properly, and then we just create the relay. So no, no magic here. Um, for whatever reason, it still didn't connect. I think. Oh, it's running. So it should be in a second. Let's see. Um, all right. I'm gonna. Well, this is. I don't know why my computer became so horribly slow when I connected it here. Um, in the meantime, the, oh, there it is, I heard it. Uh, the read analog file is something that I can highly recommend you reading it on GitHub. That's the actual testing stuff that we used. You'll find a lot of interesting things in there, including, where's my favorite line? Does anyone have an idea what this thing does? I wrote that at like 4 a.m. and I, I'm, I'm actually, I read that earlier. I was like, that's actually not bad. So this just takes a number, turns it into a binary string, um, and then splits it uh, so that you have these separate characters, reverses it, and then parses everything as uh, integers again, because we had to get the status w state, which had to be zero or one. Uh, so that's pretty much what we did, and then we just wrote it. Um, that's how you do binary operations if you really don't want to do binary, binary operations at 4 a.m. Um, all right. So the coffee machine says it's initialized. Uh, so let's ver verify this by doing a get request to this. Um, so we're just going to send a get request here. Get request comes in. It tells us it's on. Um, so that works. We're ready to brew coffee for the sir in the second row here. Um, if my code works, or if I can get to my writing my code, uh, rather. Uh, this is the script. So the only thing that my script does right now is um, formatting itself. That's great. Um, so everything that my what the hell did my oh did my ah oh, that's the wrong script. Sorry. Um, ah my mouse just doesn't move. I don't know what this is. It's the wrong project. All right, there we go. Load, 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 load. Cool. Uh, so all this does is kind of get the numbers right now of like how much you voted on each, and I'm gonna, I'm really interested in what that's gonna look like. <laughs> um, I've I've done this in Croatia before, and they were at pretty high numbers. But let's see if you kind of broke that record. Uh, so obviously we need to know what we need to make. So a simple comparison here, if it's espresso, uh, grande, and then we just say espresso or grande. We need to construct the URL that we need to do the post request to. Uh, I have mine stored already, so I don't need to type this and put typos in there. Uh, we say which type we want, and then we need to specify the access token here, uh, which again, I have stored already and then all we need to do is we need to do a post request to this with a body of start the important thing is obviously the correct content type here um, and then we say Ah, it's froze. Obviously, we need an emoji here. Um, <laughs> making your coffee. 
enjoy. Cool. If everything worked out, we can run npm start. All right. Seems like you're gonna drink some proper coffee now. Uh, <laughs> and connection refused. To localhost, why localhost? Oh yeah, thank you. Um, interesting that it tries to ping to, ping to localhost now. Always learn something new. There we go. All right, should do the post request now. Uh, I didn't log the URL, I should have logged the URL to know if it comes in. Let's go to the terminal. Came in, that's the token, there we go. And it's brewing. Um, so obviously I said earlier uh, we needed Alexa. Uh, we kind of solved that not by writing an Alexa skill, but if this then that had these, has these beautiful integrations where you can just say, hey, what if you say this to Alexa, um, then trigger a web request or whatever you want really, but like in this case we just said do a web request and this just looked like, there's always the part where the whole talk smells like coffee, um, where you just specify a URL uh, and this is what we kind of had to do things like the uh, authorization as like a query parameter um, and then uh, that's why we had to support text plane to kind of make sure, because that's the only thing aside of application JSON that is really supported. Um, and with that, I'm going to jump back into my slides. If it, I have no clue why my laptop is so slow. All right. Um, so if you want to look at the code, I should click it. Uh, if you want to look at the code, you need the URL that I can show you when I have my clicker in. That's where you can get the code. I'm going to tweet about that, so um, you can just go to the event hashtag and then uh, get the link there. Let's talk about what I learned. Um, first of all, reverse engineering is a lot of fun. Um, as I said, like I loved as a kid to kind of like peek under the hood, and we just don't do this a lot anymore. And it kind of reminds you of how things actually work that even though your coffee machine seems super analog, there is a microcontroller in there uh, and things like that. Uh, reverse engineering is very frustrating, especially in the middle of the night when you have no clue what you're doing and you're burning through LEDs literally. Um, <laughs> and uh, the problem with hardware hacking versus uh, software engineering and like classical hacking in like of like software is that we can't just git revert, you know? Like we can't just say like, ah, that just horrible, uh, went horrible, let's just go to the last thing, you know? Like you burn something, you burn something. If it's 5 a.m. and you need a new resistor, you can't just be like, ah, all right. Uh, <laughs> you know, like where do I get that now at 5 a.m.? Or worse, in Germany on Sundays, everything is closed, you know? It's like uh, I would have waited two days. Uh, JavaScript and hardware work really nicely. It was really easy to kind of like prototype these things, but it was also like with the event driven nature, it was just so easy to kind of write this code up. Uh, the Tesla 2 is a great project, a uh, great way to get started into hardware for you. Um, I highly recommend it if you, if you want to do some hardware hacking with JavaScript, this is a great place to get started. And these folks are awesome, you should definitely support them. Um, Johnny5 is super useful, uh, it's a kick-ass module that allows you to really easily write code that you can later also port to other hardware. It comes with all these classes for all sorts of things. They even come with like wiring up diagrams so it shows you how you should like, how do you wire up a button, you know? Like these were the kind of things that I had to like, I remember that from like physics last class, uh, you know, like last year in high school or do I? You know, like um, so, they actually show you how to wire up things and then underneath it they just put the code that you can use. So it's a great way to get started. Um, what's next? First of all, we need to programmatically determine the state. Um, that's what I kind of touched on earlier. The problem is these three LEDs that you see on the, on the thing are currently powered purely through the coffee machine um, and there's no way for us to read 
whether they're on or not, because they don't share the same ground as the one of my tassel. Uh, so the solution that we have in mind is a device called the optocoupler. Um, the optocoupler is basically just uh, a device that has inside, it's super tiny, but it has inside an LED and an, uh, and an infrared diode that can like read it. Um, and this is kind of like how they transfer, like this way you can measure the voltage of like two independent uh, circuits. Uh, we want to add more relays so we can get on the other three buttons. Uh, and then I'm all, I'm, I always ask for suggestions. We had things like we should have an RFID reader to see if a, if a mug is underneath it or not. Uh, we need to figure out how to like plop this thing open and put a new capsule in. Uh, so all sorts of crazy things as well. Uh, so I'm happy to have a chat later over a beer with, with you about like what we should add next or other things that we should hack at home. Um, if you want to read about this whole thing in a kind of like semi-amusing way, at least I think it's funny, um, <laughs> that's the blog post that I published on April 1st. Uh, the slide's going to be available on this URL. I'm going to tweet it, as I said, all three of them, but you can check it out again. Uh, with that, I want to say thank you. Again, I'm Dominic. I'm from Berlin. Uh, thanks for having me here. I work for Twilio. And if you have any questions, I think it's already pretty late. The beer is waiting, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions either here or over a beer. Thank you.